Good evening, folks, and a hearty welcome to our drive-in theater. We have a wonderful evening's entertainment lined up for you, one that will provide several hours of pleasurable relaxation and diversion for you and your family. Did you fail to dress up for tonight's show? No tie, an old shirt and slacks, a house dress? Well, don't give it a thought. We're glad you came as you are. We just want you to enjoy yourselves. Don't forget to visit our refreshment center during the intermission or any time. You love the tasty array of snacks we have to offer. So will the youngsters. Everything is quality and mm -hmm, so good. We hope you'll make this a weekly visit. Bring the family. Bring your friends. There are always wonderful new pictures to see, delightful snacks to nibble, a gay, pleasant evening for all. Oh, a word of caution. Don't drive over 10 miles an hour in the theater area for your safety's sake. And mom or pop, go with the kids when they leave the car. We hope you have a wonderful time. Come back soon. <laughs> It's gone. That's not all. The entire spinal cord is missing. What? It's incredible. It's as if some mental vampire were at work. Does it come from another country or another world? This terrifying menace that G2 must destroy before it's too late. The image is fading, sir. There it goes again. Same trouble. How can they stop this invisible force whose only warning is a weird, blood-chilling sound? <laughs> Only two people still alive can help this agent find the answers. The girl who could be a spy, and the scientist who could be the destroyer of the entire human race. We're facing a new form of life that nobody understands. I believe it feeds on the radiation from your atomic plants, and that it's evil. You've got to stop them. There's only one way to shut down your atomic plant. If I can get through, I can blow up the control room. planet Mars, for over 2,000 years, the symbol for war. Here is a new experience in excitement, a new sensation in suspense, as men open the door on the unknown powers of space to learn the incredible secrets of the red planet Mars, secrets that might destroy us in one moment. You'll be the next to advance science, and maybe us, right into oblivion. Chris, look. Nine, two, six. When do we done it? Dear Lord, don't make us sorry. Yeah, why don't you go to mine? If business keeps up, you'll need the army to help you. Quick, get going! Atomic energy, the hydrogen bomb, flying saucers, and now secrets beyond belief from the red planet Mars. Secrets that threaten the world with total destruction as countless millions in every corner of the globe invoke the greatest power of all to save their lives. You do think me a fool. Stay where you are. Give me a light. Don't! Don't!
day comes from. Okay, I'll see you later. Bye. You ever think of trying sleep instead of Benzedrine? You know you might like it. Sure. Brother, I've had some tough nuts to crack in my time. Thanks. Uh, nothing like this. And to top it off, this guy has to go and get himself killed right outside the base. Hmm, if he was killed. What do you mean? Well, he could have died from natural causes, you know. Uh, a switch coming from a base security man. You fellows are usually suspicious of everything. Okay. Here's the sentry's report. And uh, this just came in from the FBI. It's what they have on the dead man, Grisel. Yeah. Jacques Grisel, 35, French-Canadian, graduate of Toronto University, specialized in scientific farming, good war record, born in Toronto and went north for farming after the war. Has sister Barbara, age 24, living on the farm with him. Well, both the Grisels got a clean slate. There's nothing suspicious about them. Yeah? What was Grisel doing in the woods at 3 o'clock in the morning? Farming? Cigarette? No, thanks. Look, what are you going to do now? Get yourself all involved in this business? Let the local authorities figure it out, Jeff. Well, the colonel doesn't think it's that easy, and neither do I. Besides, who can forget the look on that dead man's face? Now, look, there's probably some simple explanation. Hmm. I don't know. Maybe Doc Warren has the answer. He should be finished with the autopsy by now. Let's go on over. Okay. Morning, Jeff. Al. Oh, hi, Doc. I've just been trying to get you. Well, what's the story? Sit down. I wasn't able to perform your autopsy. Why not? Because the mayor of Winthrop and a local doctor named Bradley, who's the coroner, too, came up and claimed the body this morning. Well, why didn't you call me? The mayor had already talked to the colonel. Oh, that's ridiculous. Well, what's the difference? They've got the body, so it's finished. Finished? Yeah, I wouldn't bet on it. They'll probably blame the death on our atomic reactors. Mm. It's his fear of radioactive fallout. We're not exploding atom bombs. We're just using atomic power for our radar experiments. Sure, go out and tell them that. You know we're a thousand miles from the nearest decent-sized city? Mm. What a bunch of backward people. They've blamed us for too little rain, too much rain. The blight, the beetle, even Mrs. O'Leary's ailing cow. That's why we have to have an autopsy, so we can prove that death wasn't caused by radiation. Well, the coroner said it was heart failure. That ought to do it. He's one of them. Well, you can't figure their minds, though. Excuse me, sir. Colonel Butler phoned to ask the Major to report to his office right away. All right, Mr. Mayor, if that's the way it is. No sense in asking you again, is there? No, sir. There'll be no autopsy. Come in. Oh, Major Cummings. Is that for me, sir? Yes, Major. I'd like to introduce Miss Barbara Grizzell and Mayor Hawkins, Major Cummings. How do you do? Major? If you don't mind, Colonel, I've made up my mind. It's all settled. Just this one point. You know that our governments, Canada and the USA, have set up this base as a joint protection for our people. We know that. And we've told you that we feel that the refusal of an autopsy... Uh, sorry, Miss Grizzell. Refusing to do it won't disrupt the effort. Miss Grizzell? Mayor Hawkins, I'm no parlor diplomat. I'm an army man. I'm straightforward, maybe even blunt. But I'm afraid I must use stronger methods of persuasion. You recognize this, Miss Grizzell? It's your brother's notebook. He's made some very interesting notations. Major, take a look at this page here. What's it look like to you? There's a timetable schedule. You know what the time's indicated in each line? What is it? Well, the schedule of our takeoffs and landings. That's enough to give me what I want, Miss Grizel. May I have a look at that notebook? Give it to her, Major. This schedule is a list of your takeoff and landings. Our herd's milk had fallen off in cream content. And my brother felt it was due to the jets flying overhead. That's why he was gathering this information. If you notice in the following pages, here's what it says. Helen, less nervous today. Quality low. Diane, apathetic. Quality poor. Mabel, very pert. General improvement. And so on with the other members of the herd. This was a daily reaction of each cow. Perhaps the colonel can tell us what he thought the items referred to. 
Well, I guess that's all we have to discuss. Thank you for coming. You know, the Colonel's a nice guy, really, but, well, he does have his problems. You don't have to apologize for him. Well, I'm not. It's just that he has a job to do, a difficult one under the circumstances. Please, I'd rather not discuss it. Okay. I was only trying to... Trying to what? Oh, I don't know. I guess I was looking for a way to say I... Well, I understand what you've been through. Do you? What the heck? I'm human. We're all human here. We're not monsters from outer space. <laughs> well, thanks. What for? Oh, for the lift and the words of comfort. I wish I could do more. I've no hard feelings if that's what you're thinking. Well, I was, but not anymore. Green Dog, Green Dog, this is Pyramid. Are you ready for Test Baker? Over. This is Green Dog. This is Green Dog. We are circling quite easily at 40,000 feet. Standing by for Test Baker. Over. Okay, Green Dog, commence Test Baker. Commence Test Baker. Over. Try starting out on the 500 mile range. Set for the 500 mile range, Sergeant. Master Scope, set at 500 mile range. Generator set, position six, Charlie. Start scanning, normal speed. Scanning, normal speed. Increase scanning speed, 20 RPMs. Scanning now, 20 RPMs. Increase range to 1,000 miles. Range increase to 1,000 miles, sir. Steady on your sensitive control, number three. Right, sir. Increase range to 1,500 miles. Range increasing to 1,500 miles, sir. Hold it steady now, Sergeant. Right, sir. Okay, Sergeant. Increase to 2,000 miles. Increasing range to 2,000 miles, sir. Range increase to 2,000. Look, sir. Siberia. Increase range of 2,500 miles. Range increase to 2,500, sir. If we can keep this equipment working right, we can watch those Russians 24 hours a day right in their own backyard. We can spot any plane, any missile, anything that's airborne. Image is fading, sir. There it goes again. Same trouble. Well, green dog, green dog, this is Pyramid. Check your equipment. Our image is fading. Repeat. Check your equipment. Our image is fading. Over. This is green dog. This is green dog. Our equipment is working OK. Over. The signal's going out OK from here, sir. There's no drop in power. There must be some interference again. There's no other answer. We'll try increasing the power. Well, sir, we're pushing the atomic plant as much as we can now. You've got to lick this power fade. Tell them to pour it on. Peterson. Well, Pete, this is Cummings, Master Control. We want you to give us everything you've got. But, Jeff, we've already exceeded the design limits. Every time you take a test, you ask for more power. If I take any more of those rods out, the reactor's liable to get out of control. Well, take some more out. We'll have to risk it. We've got to have more power. Your funeral. Mine too, probably. Yes, sir. Remove ten more rods from reactor number three. That's crazy, sir. Yeah, I know, but it's an order.
Power's been boosted, sir, but still can't increase image further. It doesn't matter how much we boost the transmitter power, it doesn't reach the plane. You know, it's almost as if the power were being drained off. Well, we'll just have to keep working on it. Yeah, and in the meantime, what new excuse do I give the Pentagon? This is Green Dog. This is Green Dog. Standing by for instructions. Over. Okay, Green Dog. Okay, Green Dog. Test Baker is completed. Return to base. Repeat. Test Baker is completed. Return to base. Over. Roger and out. Okay, Sergeant. Let's close shop. Jacques Grisel's sum of good overshadows the other. What has he marked up in the ledger for good as against the ledger for bad? He was a good, generous man. His word of service. And now we consecrate the worldly remains of our beloved Jacques to the good earth from whence he sprang. Closer and closer. Thank goodness the cows are getting used to them. Aye. Are we eating soon? It'll be ready in a minute. I just want to feed the chickens first. See you home, Barbara. No, thank you, Mayor. I think I'd better go back with Professor Walker and keep my mind occupied. Are you sure you want to? My work can wait, you know. Say, Mayor! Mayor, Ben Adams and his wife are dead, same as young Grizel. Where? Up at the farm. At the edge of the air base. But, Mayor Hawkins, you're taking a great deal for granted. There is absolutely no evidence pointing to radioactive fallout or radioactive contamination of any kind. Yes, we'll do everything we can, I assure you. Yes. Yes. Goodbye. In addition to our headaches with the Pentagon, we're now being accused of killing off the people in this town. Perhaps they'd cooperate, sir, if we could explain more about our anti-missile program. I mean, not the secret stuff. You but... know that's impossible, Jeff. Come in. It'll be rough if the town turns against us. Sir, we began a complete investigation of the Adams farm. But the local constable, a man named Gibbons, told us to get off the place. Said it came under his jurisdiction and we had no business being there. What kind of cooperation do you call that? Well, they're nervous, upset. We've got to find out how those people died. Well, suppose you get hold of the Adams relatives. See if you can persuade them to let us do an autopsy. Yes, sir, I'll try. Reassure them. Promise them anything. But get hold of those bodies. I made a complete autopsy in both cases. Call Dr. Bradley in to check my findings, and our opinions concur. It's fantastic. On the examination of the skull of Mr. Adams, I noticed two small holes in the base of the occipital region here. They penetrated to the medulla oblongata where the spinal cord meets the brain. I opened the skull to investigate and found this. The brain, it's gone. Yes. Sucked out like an egg through those two holes. That's not all. The entire spinal cord is missing. But 
It's, it's incredible. It's as if some mental vampire were at work. Where's the brain and spinal cord gone? I'm a doctor, Colonel, not a detective. There's nothing like this in the books. Major Cummings had the best explanation so far. Mental vampire. That's rubbish. Possibly some animal. Colonel, Colonel, I've lived in these backwoods all my life. And I can assure you there's no animal in these parts or anywhere else for that matter that could do that. Maybe that guy Gibbons was right about the supernatural. Well, whatever the explanation, we'll find it. We must find it. In the meantime, Doctor, I trust I can rely on your discretion. Not to tell the mayor or the townspeople. <laughs> of course, I've got an overworked practice as it is, Colonel. Thank you. Dr. Warren, I want you to get on the phone. Consult the top medical specialists, wherever they are. Yes, sir. Captain, contact the best authorities. Tell them what the problem is. Find out what they have to say about it. Jeff, the townsfolk know you. Talk to them. Check on anything that seems to be extraordinary, no matter what it is. Grizel? Oh, Miss Grizel, I, uh... Great. Look, um... Miss Grizel, I, I'm sorry for, um, barging in like that, but, um... Uh... Well, I knocked and there was no answer, and then the door was open, so I... Make yourself at home, Major. I'll be out in a minute. Uh, thank you. Just um, glancing around. That's all right. Professor Walgate was preparing these for publication anyway. Oh, are you correlating his material? I do most of it. He dictates on this. I edit the tapes and prepare the draft manuscripts. Mm, some job. Mm, but interesting. Well, the professor must be quite a guy. Thought control, cybernetics, all that stuff. Mm, that's only half of it. It's strange, isn't it? Finding a man like that here in, uh, in Winthrop. In these uncivilized backwards, I think you were going to say. Well, I'm afraid so. Well, the explanation is quite a simple one. Professor Walgate had a stroke about five years ago. He's retired now. Oh, he still works. Mm, and at odd hours. Odd hours? Mm, he thinks nothing of starting work at 11 at night and working until the small hours of the morning. Hmm. You know, the mayor mentioned that Walgate was an authority on psychic phenomena. Is that still a hobby of his? I don't know. If it is, you'll have Dr. Bradley after him. Dr. Bradley said no more overwork or excitement. What about you? What do you mean? Well, don't you ever get some time off? Well, sometimes. Hello, Howard. Come on in. Oh, this is Major Cummings from the base. Um, yeah, I know. We, we've met. Well, uh, I guess I'll be running along. Well, you've only just been here a few minutes. Oh, I was just passing on my way back to the base. Quite a roundabout route. The new airfield extension covers a lot of ground. Too much for one throps like It must keep you pretty busy. Yes, yes, there's a lot to do. I bet there is. Come again? 
You found that GI killer yet? You know, you'd be far better off hunting him down instead of Tom Catton around here. Busted. <laughs> I didn't break anything. I think you'd better leave, Major. You've done enough damage for one morning. Good night, Sergeant. Oh, good night, Sergeant. When you tell me you haven't known me long enough, yeah, okay. Okay, I'll see you later. How do you like that? She says we haven't been properly introduced, and she's a nurse. Well, I'll be made out better with the museums and stuff. No, not a chance. They all think I'm crazy. How'd you make out? Listen, now, we've got work to do. Uh, uh, you're the guy who works after five, remember, not me. Now, wait a minute. This is serious. I want you to give me all the information you can on our Professor Waldeep. Everything he's ever written. Books, articles, everything. This guy in junk by tomorrow night. So long, Mayor. Fellas, all right now, let's stop this nonsense. No fancy atomic radiation caused these deaths. What about the mayor? What killed him? Who are you trying to fool, Gibbons? It's the atomic fallout. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hold it, hold it, fellas, hold it. Someone murdered the mayor. The same maniac that killed Jack Grizzell, Ben Adams, and his wife. All right, Gibbons, where is he? If you'll shut up, I'll tell you. Right there, let him talk. Now, the fellow we're after is out there in the woods. Probably some air base GI that's gone wild. Now, we can't get far if we move fast and I say, let's stop jabbering and get after Wait, him. Wait, let's get him. All right, now, let's go. Right, fellas. Let's fight this guy. Keep a 
sharp lookout, okay? Okay, let's go. This just came in from the FBI. Hmm. Walgate, brilliant scientist, recluse, considered highly eccentric. That old guy, Walgate, sounds like a cross between Einstein and Robinson Crusoe, sir. It gets more interesting all the time. Okay, Sergeant, I'm going out for a while. to see you again. I'm very busy. Well, I'd uh, like to see the professor. Oh, yes, of course. Thank you. Come in. Professor Walgate, Major Cummings from the air base to see you. Sorry to barge in like this, uh, Professor. Not at all. These days I welcome any excuse to stop work. Isn't that so, Barbara? Please take a chair, Major. Oh, thank you. I, um, I came to see you about this, this business with the mayor. Oh, terrible tragedy, really terrible. So I need your help, Professor. Anything you say, just name it. Well, this is the fourth death in the space of a few days. Uh, not only are they terrible tragedies in themselves, but they're turning the townsfolk against us at the base. It's just ignorance, my dear fellow. These people are simple, one might say. Narrow in their outlook. Of course, the very secrecy of your activities doesn't help. This development of radar boosted by atomic power. What gave you that idea, sir? Well, there was a piece in the Atom Journal about your work on reactors. It wasn't a year ago when I read somewhere about the new radar patterns. Of course, this territory's ideal for that kind of work. I put two and two together. And made five? So we say four and a half. But you don't have to worry, Major. What I surmise, I keep to myself. Well, I hope so, sir. Well, let me offer you a drink. Whiskey? Uh, yes, please. Uh, straight. Barbara. Uh, no, thank you, Professor. I'll have the last chapter finished tomorrow. That's fine. That's real progress. I've already begun on volume two. My mind is fairly buzzing with these strange <laughs> words. <laughs> Just a few elementary ideas on the subject, Major. Not so advanced as present-day developments. I'll try and scribe these while you talk. Excuse me. That business of her brother, she was devoted to him. Yes, it was a tough break. I don't want to seem morbid, but did you see his face after he died? Yes. What was it like? I have a reason for asking. Well, it, it was an expression of complete horror. Fright. Almost insane, I guess. Did you get him? What gear? Okay, fellas. Okay, okay. Get him? No, just a false alarm. That's all. As you said yourself, sir, the people here are simple and superstitious. Maybe they're not so wrong after all. What do you mean? Mm. About the supernatural, 
Something unreal, something never seen by anyone before? I can't accept that. I've always disproved such theories. What is it, then? Nothing supernatural, I'm sure. I can't believe that. I'm a scientist. You've made a study of psychic phenomena, haven't you? I tell you, it can't be that. It, it can't be. Professor, you know what Dr. Bradley said. Was it absolutely necessary to upset the professor? It's, it's nothing, nothing, Barbara. The Major and I were just having a quiet talk. I got dizzy. Well, your quiet little talk is over, Major. First Howard Gibbons, now the professor. Do you have to go around making trouble? You really believe that, don't you? Well, I can believe my eyes. I'm sorry, Professor. I didn't mean to disturb you. No, not at all. Forgive me if I don't rise. Yes, sir. Excuse me. It's me! It's Burke! Have you finished searching the quarry yet? Yeah, and the men are tired. They want to go home. But they can't quit now. We've almost reached the air base. Well, you better tell them they won't listen to me. Okay, fellas, you spread out again. We'll join up at the Adams fence. Say, you hear something? Yeah. Funny sound. You take that path and I'll take this one. And if you see anything, shout. You said not to let each other out of sight. These paths run almost parallel to each other. We'll meet up a ways anyway. The dawn's beginning to come up. Wait a little. We'll see better then. Oh, well, we're closer there. Now, come on, boy. Go on, fella. You take that one. I think you should go home, Mrs. Gibbons. No. I'm all right, Doctor. I'll wait here for my boy. Don't worry. We'll find him. Oh, where's Howard? Where is he? We've searched everywhere. Yeah, he just disappeared. Oh, I don't believe it. He must be there. I'm going to look for him myself. You can't go in the woods alone. Oh, but i got to find him. I've got to find my boy. Oh, you'd better see that she gets home. Get your wife to look after her. Have you searched the woods thoroughly? We kept calling for him. If Gibbons is out there and still alive, he would have heard us. No point in searching anymore. I reckon we ought to call a council meeting and decide what we're going to do. Yeah, what about it, Bradley? Well, let's get Melville. He's a deputy mayor. I suppose it's up to him. Good evening. Everyone quiet, please. Now you all know why we're here. We've had four deaths, and now our constable has disappeared. The cause of these deaths is still unknown. Everybody seems to have their own ideas, and they all seem connected with the new air base. Now you're talking. 
For this reason, I've asked Major Cummings to this meeting. He's going to help us in any way he possibly can. That goes for his commanding officer, Colonel Butler, who is very concerned about what's happened. Cut out the soft soap, Melville. Let's get down to brass tacks. All I know is, before this air base came here, we were doing fine. Now you and these Air Force fellows tell us that it's not radiation at all. Well, maybe you're right at that. I don't know. But forgetting about the deaths, how do you explain the change in quality of the cow's milk, even the quantity? Let the Major tell me about that. Go ahead, Major. Well, no one can make anyone believe something if they don't want to believe it. But it has been positively proven that there is no radiation affecting anyone in Winthrop. Mm. Not even the cows. As for the milk, I don't know enough about farming, but I would assume... Rizal did. He knew his business. And so do I. It was the noise of the jets that did it. Nothing more. It frightened the herd. But I can tell you that the herd is normal again. They've got used to it. Thank you. As for the deaths, gentlemen, we are equally at a loss to give an answer, and equally disturbed. Now, there's been some talk of a mad GI on the prowl. Well, this, I can assure you, is not true. We've checked and rechecked our personnel. We know how you feel, but we're trying to protect our countries from a guided missile attack. If you would only help us instead of fighting us. Uh, it's all a waste of time. Let's get rid of the base. We had no trouble before they came here. We'll have no trouble after they leave. I think that's rather foolish. Huh? Terrible, Jeff. What could have happened to him? I don't know. Would you like a drink? No, no, thanks. Barbara, I think Professor Walgate is involved in these deaths. I don't understand. Not, neither do I. Maybe it's just a hunch, but his background, his training. Oh, Jeff. Look, Barbara, I've checked on Walgate. This, uh, this research of his. Somehow, I think it ties in with what's happened here in Winthrop. Oh, that's crazy. Is it? Mind if I borrow this? Where are you going? I'd like to take a look at your cemetery.
Any word yet from Major Cummings? Not a thing yet, sir. Well, keep trying. Hello? Uh, hello, Miss Grizel. This is Captain Chester. I've been trying to locate Major Cummings. Well, he left here about 7.30. Well, did he say where he was going? Yes. He, he borrowed a flashlight for me and said something about going to the cemetery. Look, I don't like the sound of all this. You wait there. I'll be over right away. This place, all right. Dreaming, buddy. It's Barbara. Oh, well, locked in. No air. Take it easy now. Really? Come on, let's get going. We'll, we'll get you back to the base. Come on. 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 Come Come in. Come on. Come it's very late. I hope you don't mind, sir. Oh, on the contrary, I'm glad to see you. Sit, sit down, won't you? We, uh, we missed you at the town council meeting. I saw Gibbons afterwards. His mind was gone completely mad. It's dreadful. I was hoping maybe you could help us, sir. Me? How, how could I help you? You're an atomic expert. Who told you that? Our files in Washington. Have you been checking on me? Yes. Oh. Yeah, would you, um... Do you care for a cigarette, Professor? No, thanks. I'm attached to my pipe. Uh, Professor, I read one of your books on the uh, materialization of thought. Uh, you denied that it was possible, but the thought was intriguing. Yes, if it could be done, why, man could create power by thought. He could will a door to open. He could perform useful work without moving from his chair. Practically anything. I said it was impossible, mm. didn't I? Is it? Perhaps with atomic power it could be done. Oh, please, I'm tired and sick. Stop badgering me, please. I will if you'll answer me a few questions. Jeff! I'm sorry, but I've got to go on. What were you doing in the cemetery tonight, Professor? Were you, um, looking for this? I didn't mean to shut you in, close the door on you. I was frightened when I heard you. I, I only wanted time to get away. I only realized later that you might be shut. 
trapped. I, I called Barbara, but she If she hadn't rescued me, I wouldn't be alive. Yeah. What were you doing there, Professor? I had to examine the mayor's body. I had to find out the truth. What was that? Professor, what's the Professor, matter? what's the matter? Yeah, it's okay. Professor, can you hear me? It's a terrible story. Shut down your atomic plant. Radar. Call Dr. Bradley right away. I'm going back to the base. Jeff, be careful. I'm afraid. I'll be back right away. If I try that again, we'll have more time. But the thing's fantastic. You can't shut down a whole atomic power plant on such a wild theory. Well, you can't deny the facts, sir. Grizel, the Adams couple, the mayor, they all died a few minutes after the peak of our radar test, right after our atomic plant was operating under full power. But it'll take months to get the plant operating again. Well, it's better than risking any more lives or madmen like Gibbons. Okay. Let's put it on ice. How soon you'll be ready, Pete? We'll shut her down in five minutes. The rods are all smashed. What happened? I don't know. We just found them all broken. We'll never be able to shut her down now. What about spares? You know how we put this place together, Jeff. We've no extras of anything. Well, there must be some way of controlling the reaction. Well, the rods, we don't stand a chance. The nearest supply would be at the Hanford Works in the Columbia River. How soon can we get a shipment flown in here? Oh, four to six hours, if you phone right now. Get me the Hanford Works on the Columbia River right away. Well, Doc, how is he? Oh, there's no question. It's another attack a little more serious than the last. He'll be all right. Oh, sure, sure, sure. See, he gets plenty of rest. Call me if there's any change. For goodness sake, get somebody out here to stay with you. Jeff, uh, Major Cummings said he'll be back soon. Jeff, Major Cummings? <laughs> Obviously, those rods were destroyed. How and for what reason, we don't know. But we do know that we're in trouble up here. Serious trouble. Hello. Yes, put her through. It's for you, Jeff. Barbara Grizel. Thank you. Hello, Barbara. OK, good. We'll be right over. Right, bye. Walgate's regained consciousness. I think we'd better get over there right away, sir. Right. Now, we better get some sidearms. Check. Casper, get hold of Dr. Bradley and Melville right away. Have them meet us at Walgate's house. I shall feel better after I've told you everything. Maybe you can help me to clear up this ghastly business. But no matter what you do to me, remember those horrible deaths were beyond my control. Go on, Professor. For many years now, I have been working on a theory of thought materialization. The entire apparatus to give it the required boost is in my laboratory. Laboratory? Didn't know you had one. There were many things you didn't know, my child. If you had, you'd never have come here again. You can see it later. But I knew I could never succeed on the principles of telepathy. I needed to stimulate my brain to the extent that I could detach thought from my conscious to give it a separate entity of its own. I concentrated on the simplest experiment to turn the page of a book. I designed an instrument to create a sudden and powerful electrical boost to help me free my thought. But each application of the electric charge created a shock almost equal to electrocution. It made me ill. Dr. Bradley diagnosed exhaustion. He thought my illness was caused by overwork in getting my papers ready for publication. He introduced me to Barbara Grizel. With Barbara as my secretary, I was able to satisfy my publisher and continue my experiments to materialize thought. 
For a long time, I persisted in this one experiment without success. Until one night. Lightning in striking the house gave my instruments a sudden violent charge of power. And my thought was free. Free to turn the page of a book. I altered the design of my equipment to generate these violent power boosts. But it was very dangerous. And I could only undergo each experiment after a long period of rest. Whenever I felt well enough to absorb the shock, I found no difficulty in moving small objects. Eventually, I developed a certain tolerance to the high voltages I used. But what I really needed for regular experiments was a new form of power. Something that was smoother, something that would flow through my brain without causing collapse. The new atomic plant at the air base provided me with this power. I devised additional apparatus that enabled me to divert a portion of the atomic power that was radiating between the ground station and the radar aircraft circling 40,000 feet above. It was power which I could control, and I learned how to amplify my thoughts without hurting myself. I was able to detach my thoughts and allow them to work on their own. I began to devise a being into which the thought, once released, could enter and preserve itself for all humanity. I envisaged something akin to the human brain, with life and mobility, but without the limitations of man's body. I concentrated my entire thought on its creation. I succeeded, but like thought itself, it was invisible. That night I entered my laboratory to take advantage of a radar test, only to find the place in shambles. My equipment wrecked beyond repair. All of my notes about its creation and how I thought it could be controlled were destroyed. I knew now that I had created a fiend. There was no other explanation. I was helpless, but whom could I tell? Who would believe such a fantastic story? I could sense the presence of the fiend there in the room with me, growing more powerful with each succeeding day. My one desire was to destroy the thing, but I possessed no means of projecting my thought to do so. Then I could hear it. Was it possible that there were more than one? I was unable to stop them. They were now drawing power from the atomic station. Its intelligence had expanded. It now knew how to make its escape. And then followed these horrible deaths and Gibbon's madness. I had to know what I had done. I had to see one of the bodies. I went to the mayor's tomb. I now know that I have created a mental vampire. A fiend that needs to... Drain the intellect to survive and multiply. I'll get it. Supposing you're right, Professor, how does it live? How else? Put in the brains and nerve centers removed from these dead people. Then where are they and why can't we see them? This is nonsense. We're facing a new form of life that nobody understands. I believe it feeds on the radiation from your atomic plant and that it's evil. Professor, it's my opinion that the evil's all in your mind. You're in need of medical assistance. Ah, oh, Doctor, I'm glad to see you're here. This man's become a raving lunatic. Hey, what's going on out there? Hey, look! Hello. Hello! 
Professor, what's wrong with your telephone? Nothing should be the matter unless they've got enough intelligence to cut the lines. Jeff, I want you to get over to the air base. I want emergency patrols. <laughs> He's dead. Now, give me a hand with this. Hey, quick, barricade that window. Professor, have you got anything we can nail across that window? There's some lumber in my laboratory. I've got to get out. I've got to get out of this. Pull yourself together and help me with this. I know, unless it's a question of the amount of atomic radiation that's available. Hello. Hello, Casper. Casper, I want to talk to the Colonel. Hello? Hello, Casper, are you there? Hello? Hello? Out of here, I tell you. Oh, no, 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 no. Melville, Melville, get a grip on yourself. Get a hold of yourself. Why are they so quiet? Maybe they're going to leave us alone. I doubt it. But they've just put out a burst of energy. Perhaps they need to rest. Colonel Butler. Yes. How long does it take to shut down your atomic plant? Why? If my theory is right, then without the radiation of which I was speaking, these things must die. Good grief. What is it? What do you see? Let me through! Hey, Jeff, Professor, they're becoming visible. or something must have increased the power of the atomic plant. What have I unleashed? Ghastly is horrible. Oh, you can say that again. It all ties up with what Dr. Warren explained to us, sir. Look carefully. Get those sidearms. I'm sure it's the atomic plant. So long as it goes on, they will multiply. Getting stronger and stronger. Yeah, well, we'll see about that. Well, anyway, they're mortal.
He's dead. We've got to stop him. There's only one way to shut down your atomic plant. Unless we shut off the radiation, we'll all be destroyed, and heaven knows how many others. Well, sir, there's a dynamite shed between here and the plant. If I can get through, I can blow up the control room. Well, if that's the way it's got to be. I'm afraid it is. Jeff! Must it be you, Jeff? Yeah, I, I know the control room layout. They don't. Be careful, Jeff, please. Yeah, I... And be sure and lock this door. He can't go alone. He won't last a minute amongst those fiends. It's too late, Professor. Anyway, somebody had to get through. Then cover him as he leaves the house. And shoot straight. Don't waste a shot. You see him? No, not yet. Suicide. For my creation, perhaps I can control them. Give Jeff a chance. Lock it after me. No. Take it easy now. I know that guy, and if anybody can get through, he can. since Jeff left. Don't even think about it. It's so quiet. I wonder what they're up to. Colonel, we're almost out of ammunition.
Well, Captain, let's get started. Doc, I'll send you some help over as soon as I get over to the air base. Thanks, Colonel. What about Jeff? He's been gone for hours. It's okay, honey. It's all over. Well, Major, I'm leaving you in charge. Report back when you have the situation well in hand. Good luck, Jeff. Thanks, boy. Well, Doc, I hope now that we got this thing licked, you'll, you'll encourage your people to cooperate with us. Well, I reckon we owe it to you, Major. And it strikes me you uh, are setting a very good example. Famous for gracious living and delicious cooking comes America's favorite barbecue sandwich, Castleberries, of course. You'll find this taste-tempting barbecue and other good things to eat and drink at our snack bar. Remember, Castleberries brings you genuine southern barbecue, cooked slowly over open pits to the peak of barbecue flavor in the true tradition of the Old South. Here's old-fashioned southern barbecue at its mouth-watering best with that wonderful hickory smoke flavor. So for a real treat, enjoy a Castleberry barbecue sandwich. At our refreshment stand, your wish is our command. So the coffee we serve there is pure perfection. not yet told. It begins on a warm evening some years hence, when high on a mountaintop in Southern California, a giant telescope searches the heavens for the secrets there contained. You can't see it with the naked eye, but the micrometer shows it clearly. No question of the change in altitude. Dr. Russell. Hello, Chris. Hello, Miss Linda. Hello, Doctor. Sorry to have kept you waiting. Uh, they certainly tuck you in up here. They wouldn't even let us into the viewing room. They've classified the sky top secret now. <laughs> uh, Lewis. I asked Elder to develop these as quickly as possible. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, Bolting. This is Chris Cronin, Mrs. Cronin. My assistant, Dr. Bolting. Hello, how do you do? How do you do? It's nice meeting you. Well, I hope you don't mind my tagging along. Oh, not in the least. We're very happy to have you. May I take your coat? You know, I expected you to be older. You are the radio man. Mm -hmm. If you think of yourself as the guy with the spyglass. <laughs> <laughs> I really walked right into that. I didn't mean it quite as it sounded. But do you seriously believe that you've established contact with Mars? Well, you take pictures of it. Why shouldn't I talk to it? Bolty! Yes. 
there's no question they have diminished in size. There's no knowing what tonight's pictures may show. We may learn more about Mars in the next few minutes. So that's the baby in person. It's so clear, it's unbelievable. This is the first picture. We took it a week ago tonight. See, here are the indentations I told you about. They couldn't be plainer. And all going from north to south. What are they? Canals, what else? Traversing the entire planet. And these big shadows, here and here. Now you know how New York or Chicago would look if photographed from Mars. And look at those mountains at the pole. They must be as high as the Rockies. How do you tell they're mountains? There have to be. What else would throw such deep shadows? Dr. Mitchell, what puzzles me is that you've had the giant telescope for years. Why are you just getting these pictures now? Mars's journey around the sun is an elliptical curve. Uh, let me show you. It's now at perihelion, about 35 million miles from Earth, instead of the usual 63. Now, what's this one? Same angle, same exposure five nights ago. See any difference? Should I? Well, what have you got? I don't know. I can't believe it. Where? The mountains are gone. And the poles are level. You can't wipe out mountains taller than the Rockies in the space of a week. Bolting. Uh, look at the canals. They're different. Now they reflect light like mirrors. Water reflects light. Well, so does any other. Are you saying you think those pole formations are ice? And that in, in, a, in a week, these Martians have, have melted ice caps thousands of feet high and used the water to irrigate the planet? Isn't that what the picture says? But that's impossible. There's no way to. Oh, there has to be. Why, well, they've done it. If we could just once ask them how. I thought you'd already established contact. Oh, it's Mars I'm getting my signal from right enough, but how do I get that signal meaning? How do I find a means of communication? Come on, Lynn, let's get going. There's still time to send a signal. You're going to broadcast tonight? After seeing these? <laughs> what do you think? One man who takes pictures, another who believes he can talk over 35 million miles. It's like having a grandstand seat for the creation of the world. Or it's death. Since you saw those pictures, you've fear, been... Fear, Chris. Always eating fear. The whole world scared. Why shouldn't I be? Every woman in the world, we all live in fear. It's, it's become our natural state. Fear our sons will have to fight another war. Or fear they'll face worse. We've lived on the edge of a volcano all our lives. One day it has to boil over. Me talking to Mars won't affect Vesuvius, Lynn. How can you be so sure? 
Don't you understand? Science has made the volcano we're sitting on. Nobel invented dynamite to ease man's life. It's eased a good many into annihilation. Einstein split the atom to create energy. Is Terra energy? Well, that's rubbish, Lynn. Scientifically, we've advanced further in the past 60 years than we have in the previous 2,000. Radio, television, automobile, airplane, atomic fission, jet propulsion. And, and now, well, you, you saw those pictures tonight, heard what Mitchell said. If we can once talk to Mars, we may be talking to brains as far ahead of ours as, as ours are ahead of monkeys. In one moment, we may be able to leap ahead another 2,000 years. the next to advance science, and maybe us, right into oblivion. Linda. I'm sorry, Chris. But when I saw those pictures tonight, it, it all seemed too imminent. Well, sure it's imminent. It's what we worked for, isn't it? Why we built this lab, assembled the transmitter. It's why we've worked together all these years. They've been good years, Chris. Well, they've been great years. What do you want me to do now? Get a, a crummy research job in some plant? Maybe in 20 years, get a paper published in some scientific magazine? Now, when we're on the verge of accomplishing everything we've worked for? All right, Chris. I'm ready. What do I say? That, that if I thought anything we're doing could boomerang against you or the kids, I'd blow up the whole works? You know that. But it can't hurt anyone. Whatever's been done, we've done together, Linda. Well, I don't believe harm can come from anything those hands have had a part in, that's all. All right, Chris. Let's go. Who am I to stand in the way of science? did you get here? How did you track me down? Get out! Stop acting like a fool! Get out of here! I told you not to follow me! supposed to keep in touch with me by shortwave. The seal isn't even broken. I have nothing to report. What are you doing here? Answer me! You said you would establish contact with Mars. That was your commitment. I'm 
tried. We are not paying you to try, Mr. Calder. We expect results. And you might have had results if you had done as I asked. Conduct your experiments at our laboratories at Berezovo, where we could have supplied you with skilled assistance. Instead of which, you buried yourself here in the Andes, alone. No one to assist you. You mean, uh, no one to watch over me. Thank you. I've had one taste of jail. I don't know why you complain. We extricated you. We helped you. We want scientists of your caliber, Mr. Calder. We treat them well when they serve us. Serve? Are you talking to me? I don't owe you anything. You owe us your freedom. It was the Americans who threw you into jail and our men who helped you to escape. Not to mention all this equipment which you have piled up. This was an investment. Now we demand an accounting. I'm not a bookkeeper. We don't make investments with no returns. You know our policy. Are you trying to frighten me? We had an agreement. It is my responsibility to see that it is carried out. <laughs> You're threatening me with extermination, eh? Is that the policy you refer to? You find the idea amusing? Highly. <laughs> you won't harm me. You need me. Think they have humbled me, eh? Bringing me, Franz Corbin, to this. Cringing, hiding. Just another rat in his hole. But all this won't last. The rat will come out. And then the world will listen. You want a report? I'll give you one. You can tell your masters that I've failed in my experiments. I've not been able to establish contact with Mars. Their money's been wasted. It is not a report they will appreciate. Still, they won't exterminate me. Of that, I wouldn't be too sure. Because you can also tell them that the Americans who stole my valve have succeeded. They have established contact with the Red Planet. Wait outside. Serious? Newspapers will tell you as much in a few days. It's not in the American character to keep silent about success. But that's incredible that they should actually... Why? You expected it from me. But you said that your equipment was the best in the world. That no one could duplicate your developments. I forgot the seven years start the American had on me. Seven years while I was in jail. Seven years. Uh, don't let's start that again. What shall I report? What can you report? That the Americans also want the secrets of a wiser civilization so that they can turn them into new methods of destruction? How do you know all this? Because I'm the one other person with a hydrogen valve. I alone can pick up their signals and the replies. Then you can give us the questions they put to Mars and the answers they receive. Yes, exactly. And that's why I can laugh at your threats. Do you still want to kill me? Oh, don't talk like that. Nobody is threatening you. You're invaluable to us. It's not who gets the information first, but who first puts it to use. Oh, my dear friend. You must let me send you a less monotonous diet. My diet's already taken care of. I did not spend all your money on equipment. Is there anything else you need? Yes, one thing. Let's drink to it. Well, by all means, my dear fellow. <laughs> Your absence. Thank you very much.
much, comrade. Considerate of you, leading us to his lair. Clever of you, dragging him down all on the strength of a single phrase. He thought himself so clever with us, you can find me only through finding Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Dropped your bunny rabbit. Mm. What was that outburst? He woke up and couldn't find his rabbit. I guess I'd better get the... Uh, Here's your carbona. Oh. How did you know we'd need this? Did you two ever start a project and not need it? She's pretty smart, huh? Hey, Mom, I got a TL for you. Yeah, I could use one. Remember when the parents came to visit our class? One of my grimmest memories. All the fellas decided that you were the youngest-looking mother there. Isn't that nice? Boy, you should have seen those other crows. Uh, that did it. Now clean away this mess and get started on, on your homework. Right. Gosh, I only got my math to do. You know I don't want to fuss over that. Well, before you pin any medals on yourself, an extra hour on history wouldn't hurt. At that, you're no genius. Well, you can't have everything. Oh, heavens, who's coming? Probably Mitchell to find out if Mars had anything intelligible to say. I'll get it. Is Mr. Cronin in? I'm Cronin. I'm Bill Carey. This is no time to barge in on you like this, but your reports didn't reach my desk until this morning, and I flew right out. My reports brought you out? Oh, we grasp at any straw to get out of Washington for 24 hours. Please come in, Admiral. Thank you. I'm Linda Cronin. How do you do, Miss Cronin? Uh, forgive the mess, but all major mechanical projects seem to get started in the living room. This is our son, Stuart. Hiya, fella. Uh, sit down, Admiral. Get some more ice, will you, son? Stewart, you will have a drink, won't you? Well, at this hour, I can't claim the sun's not over the yard arm. Are you the Admiral Carey who broke the Japanese code? My one claim to fame. But confidentially, it wasn't a very good code. <laughs> Come on, Stu. Oh, you don't know how glad I am to see you. We didn't know if you'd even bother with our show here. <sighs> Rose to it like a marlin. But what beats me... If you are getting messages from Mars, how have you kept it out of the paper? Well, we're not getting any messages. Not yet. Darn close to it if your reports stand up. Oh, if we ever do get messages, understandable ones, that is, they'll be given out. Four years of Navy gave me my belly full of hush-hush. <laughs> I can understand that. So far, all we're getting are repetitions of our own signals coming back at us. And now these answers you get... Please sit down. These answers you get, couldn't they be your own signals bouncing off some object in outer space? Some other planet? Booming back at you? I'm no authority on electronics, but I am. No, this is no bounce back. As I told you, we transform sound into light. And the speed of light is 186,000 miles a second. So you divide the distance to Mars by the speed of light, and you get the length of time it takes our light waves to reach Mars. Double that, and you get the time it takes our messages to come back. Now, that could all be mechanical, but they don't come back in that exact number of minutes. It never takes less time, always more. 20 seconds, 40 seconds, sometimes as much as a minute and a half. Sometimes, like tonight, for instance, we get no answer. An echo will always sound, but sometimes the human brain sleeps. But why always the same signal back? Why never anything you can hang on to? Well, because I'm too stupid to give them a lead. That's why I yelled for help. Well, this is no picnic you've asked me on. You don't even know what language they speak, if any. It's like working out a system of communication with gollywogs. How the devil to find a point of contact? How about pie? That's hardly the way to offer it, Stu. And by the size of that slice, I doubt if there's anything left. I mean pie. Now, what are you talking about? Well, if we're getting answers, they have to have a transmitter as powerful as ours. Go on, what are you driving at? 
Well, they can't build anything like that unless they know how to make a wheel. That means a circle. And you can't make a circle without knowing the ratio of the diameter to the circumference. Pi. I still don't understand what that has to do with... The... Your son's ahead of you, Cronin. What is pi? 3.1416, as I remember. Roughly. That's it, roughly. Actually, it's 3.1415926 and so on, an infinite number of decimals. Well, so what? We broadcast 3.1416 to Mars, and what can they answer? Nothing. But they must be trying as hard to talk to you as you're straining to talk to them. All they're looking for is an opening. So, you don't broadcast 3.1416. You broadcast 3.1415. And if they understand, they continue the equation. Right. Hey, where'd you get that idea, son? Biting into this. <laughs> Come on, let's get over to the lab and try it on right now. Aren't you coming? Oh, don't mind me. I'm just the babysitter around here. If this comes off, I'll wake him when we come in. What makes you think I'll be asleep? Three, one, four, one, five. Three, one, four, one, five. Three, one, four, one, five. Shut it off. What do we do now? Uh, the blast of waiting is always the worst part. How long? Three minutes, eight seconds each way. Six minutes, 16 seconds all told. Plus the time it takes them to answer, if they answer. You know, this is going to be the longest six and a quarter minutes I ever spent. You light that pipe, Admiral. And if Chris's hydrogen doesn't blow you up, he will. <laughs> Always the danger of a leak and no way of telling it. Hydrogen's odorless. I told you I was no authority on electronics. What's the hydrogen for? Well. The hydrogen sufficiently pressurized can be brought down to a temperature of about 451 degrees below zero. And nobody knows why, but sound waves can be picked up at that temperature that would be otherwise completely inaudible. And now certain minerals also have incredible acoustic properties. The quartz, for instance. Now that's what this valve is made of. And we, we warp it with a pressurized hydrogen. It gives us the energy for a power transmission a thousand times greater than any sound transmitter ever conceived. There it is. The red planet Mars, for over 2,000 years, the symbol for war. And we dare to fly in the face of Providence and try to bring it closer to us. Sometimes my wife is less than enthusiastic about this project. I'm sorry. Darling, if nothing happens tonight, don't be too disappointed. It's got to happen. It's just got, got to happen. We've waited so blasted long. I know, but if it doesn't... Poor Linda with all her silly fears. You hope it doesn't happen, really? You know what beats me? I just can't believe that you people really assembled all this yourself. No, we got a, we got a slight assist from the Carnegie Foundation. You realize if this comes off by this time tomorrow, you'll be the most famous man in the world? <laughs> Funny, none of the credit's mine. Actually, it all belongs to a German scientist, a criminal, a brilliant criminal, with nothing but hate in his heart. What do you mean? Did you ever hear of Franz Calder? 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 Do you remember the famous quotation, the human being is the best guinea pig? High voltage experiments on the human nervous system, the Nazi criminal. He invented the valve. I found the blueprints at Nuremberg. It's taken us all the years since then to, to build a transmitter capable of spanning the enormous distance. And we've been broadcasting for eight months, first without success, and now... The last for... three weeks. Uh, we've been getting answers. Well, you're not going to give Calder any of the credit. Why not? It's his valve. The devil's entitled to his due. Two minutes to go. I wonder what kind of a world we're opening the door on. You'd wonder even more if you saw the pictures of Mars that we saw last night. Ice caps, thousands of feet high, melted away in a few days. Oh, those people must use atomic power as we use water. If we had that power, why, the, the largest liner would cross the ocean on the energy contained in one lump of coal. Mm-hmm. Then what would happen to the people who own and work coal mines? 
Well, what happened to the people who owned or worked on canals when the railroad started? Still, Mr. Calder will have had his effect on the world. Wonder where he is now. We are all good scientists we don't hear of. In Russia, I suppose. Ten seconds to go. Switch out the lights, will you, darling? Three. One. Four. One. Five. Three, one, four, one, five, three, one, four, one. Five. Our own signal back, the same blasted story. Chris, look! Nine! Two! Six! When do we've done it? Dear Lord, don't make us sorry. Cronin is sticking to the establishment of mathematical and chemical formulas. Very ingenious. They were able to frame a few questions. I read all that in the papers. What about you? Have you contacted Mars yourself? You're a fool, Eugenia. If I can read their messages, they can read mine. Why should I let them know that they have competition? Huh? And so, what only two weeks ago was a secluded laboratory in the San Diego mountains has become the new center of the world. Scientists, code experts, newsmen, all concentrated on only one thing. The first concrete word from Mars. Ladies and gentlemen, step right up closer. I want to introduce you to the keyhole of Mars. Now I have the only authentic, genuine picture of the planet Mars. What a thrill. What a thrill. He just sent home to those people. All right, folks. Come on, folks. Keep moving. Ladies and gentlemen, come on, folks. The planet Mars is educational and constructive. Mr. Cronin, been to town? Yeah, just down to see how the press camp's coming along. Uh, they've got to put up two more buildings. Stewart wanted to see Admiral Carey and his staff at work. Итак, всего неделю тому назад еще никому не известный молодой американский ученый по фамилии Христофор Кронин, живущий работающий в своей лаборатории близ города Сан-Диего в Калифорнии, стал центром внимания всего цивилизованного мира. Отлично событий. Впервые за все время своего существования Земля.
And so the weeks of preparatory work are over. Communication with Mars is now a reality. Tonight has brought us the first real information about life on that distant planet. They were asked the average lifespan on Mars. Their answer, 300 Earth years. That can 300 years? I hope not your mother. Our regular program. Pensions for 235 years. Who's going to pay them? stock industry is at stake. Is the government going to continue to support the price of potatoes? Just a minute. How about the price of wheat? The hysteria which has greeted the Martians' claims has become a national peril. All this after the release of only three messages. Ladies and gentlemen, I cannot too strongly stress the necessity for calmness. Do not allow yourselves to be emotionally disturbed by those messages. A genius. This time you'd better get your masters on the phone. Cronin's just received a message from Mars. That's a sensation. The Martians have now announced that for the past three centuries, they haven't used coal, oil, electricity. Any form of power on which we rely, theirs has all been provided by cosmic energy, through which they have made hundreds of elements fissionable. If this is true, no miner in America, no miner in the world will have a job. Our interests are identical. We owners represent an investment of five billion dollars. It took Mars to make you recognize that identity of interest. Well, the oil men are in the same boat with us. Then let them bail it out. Oil is no concern of ours. for the news. I've had enough news for one day. Meanwhile, this morning, every American bank had long lines of depositors waiting to withdraw their funds. Owing to the difference in time, the latest bulletin from Mars had created its effect on Europe before we Americans had finished our breakfasts. In London, the Prime Minister called a special meeting of the Cabinet at number 10 Downing Street. But this did not prevent pandemonium on the London Stock Exchange. The value of British industrials has decreased nearly 10 billion pounds in the last two weeks. In Paris, the third government in two weeks failed of a vote of confidence. And President Romain, hopeless of forming a fourth government, suspended the Constitution and called upon the army to establish martial law. 
This, however, did not prevent wide disorders in Lyon, Marseille, and other French cities. Meanwhile, in Rome, the Holy Father urged a policy of patience and of faith. Turn that blasted thing off. Just on another minute, Dad. But in Milan and Genoa, there was widespread rioting. Turn it off, I said. They got to hand it to you, Pop. When you blow the lid off, you really blow it off. Well, that crowd out there is mad I enough. thought I told you to stay out of the street. I just wanted to take a look. Haven't you anything better to do than lollygag around where you haven't any business? It's enough work for you to do around here. Gosh, I did the whole lawn this afternoon. Yeah, and left the moor where everybody could stumble over it as usual. Trick or treat! Trick or treat! What's he made up for? It's Halloween, remember? And children like to go out and play trick or treat. That is, children who can get out of the house, too. And little boys who can't. They still like the fun of getting dressed up. You look scrumptious, son. <gasps> See? Bottle tops. Trick or treat? Next year we'll go trick or treat. How'll yeah. that be? <laughs> On your way, boys. And hands washed. Stu, will you see that he's polished up? Oh, Mom, again? Please. Be a good boy. I'll be in in a minute, dear. I'm sorry, Lynn. You don't have to take it out on the kids, Chris. Is that what I'm doing? I'm sorry. Where are you going? The lab. Carrie's ordered some new gadget installed. How's it going? Oh, evening, sir. Quite an installation you're getting here. What is it? Oh, it's the latest thing. We've only installed one other like it. That was in the Pentagon. It's an improvement on the cathode ray oscillograph. As soon as we get it wired up, then we're putting it outside in the cement vault. You'll take down your messages right off the transmitter. It records them on film. Go ahead, light it. Huh? <laughs> Be interesting to see if the place really would blow up. You'll recall, Mr. Secretary, that the Joint Chiefs advised immediate control when the first message was received. Yes, I recall quite well, General. I also recall that the President overruled us. Yes? Admiral Carey, sir. Have him come in. Mr. Secretary? General Burdett? Hello, Bill. Sit down, Carey, sit down. Have you decoded any other messages? No, sir. We've been sweating over a batch for nearly a week now, but no success. Thank heaven for that. We're closing down that decoding room out in California. But messages are still coming in, sir. Well, they'll be microwaved here as fast as they come in. And they're not getting outside this building. Your whole staff's coming back today. Nothing is to be released to the public. Nothing, you understand, gentlemen? Nothing. Is there anything else, sir? Our economic system is shambles. Industrial production shot to blazes. Our entire civilization collapsing about our heads like a house of cards. And the whole Western world going down with us. This Cronin has done more to smash the democratic world in the last four weeks than the Russians have been able to do in 11 years. I can hear the laughter in Moscow now. No, Admiral, no. There is nothing more. Calling to BLM, calling to BLM. To BLM here, go ahead. Where's the genian? Where's the genian? You will call him on another wavelength. 
9434 kilocycles. Broadcast band E. Use scrambler number five. The call number is 9K BLM. Your call will be relayed. He's waiting for you. Calling 9K BLM. Calling 9K BLM. Товарищ дежурный, передайте товарищу Орджиньяну, что Кольдер его вызывает. Слушай. Go ahead, Calder. This is Argenian. Are you all right? Uh, don't worry about me. How about you? How are you, Argenian? Ah, huh? <laughs> oh, that's foolish of you to go where those monsters can lay hands on you. Shut up, you fool. Premier Sprashevite, yes, the drugie novici. Are there any more messages? Mars seems to have run out of messages for the moment. Chem interest with Americanti? What are the Americans asking, Calder, if you can tell us that? As nearly as I can understand, they want to know how the Martians, if they use cosmic power for everything, are kept from blowing each other to bits. Send us the messages as soon as you get them. There must be no slip-ups. Is that understood? Haven't you got your money's worth yet? Не беспокойтесь, товарищ генерал. Не думаю, что американцы... Is this dog, Calder, reliable? Я сказал вам in English. If I want him to understand me, I'd speak Russian. Why didn't you insist on him coming here to work? I couldn't insist. He would have destroyed his valve. He's a madman, a lunatic. The world is full of lunatics. They want to start a war now. Now, and there is no need. Stalin did not dare precipitate one because he could not defeat the free economy of the West. Now the economy is shattered. The strength of the Western world fades like a dream in the night. Their civilization perishes. Lenin dreamt of the world in his hands. Stalin tried to get it in his. Our premier will succeed. We will build our new world on the ruins of the West. Dr. Stokes? Yes. Yours is identical with Robert's translation. It can't mean anything else. How do you explain it? I don't even try. All the other messages deal with such abstruse scientific data that we can't make any headway. Then out of the blue, this. Why, it, it's... It's inspiring, Admiral, if nothing else. Get me the Secretary of Defense. He's at the White House, sir. Prepare a memorandum to him. Aye, aye, sir. Eyes only. Eyes only. We can't risk the Russians decoding those messages. I certainly don't want war. But Moscow, Leningrad, every nerve center in the Soviet Union must be wiped out. I cannot fly in the face of 180 years of American history. I cannot start a war. A month from now, we may not have the strength to fight one. The Russians may have in their hands the power No. To... This country will not launch a war. Mr. President. You still know my first name, George. We've served a great many years together. And there's never been a day when I couldn't happily go along with any decision of yours. But I have a responsibility to this country, too. And I can't stand by and see it destroyed. Our difference is that I don't believe it can be destroyed by 13 slips of paper covered with obscure symbols. The Japanese Empire was destroyed by a slip of paper covered with obscure symbols. Once those symbols were translated into power. Excuse me, sir. 
Yes. You said to interrupt the men that they arrived, sir. Oh, yes, sir. Have them come in, please. Won't you come in, please? How do you do, Mrs. Cronin? How do you do, Mr. President? Mr. Cronin? Mr. President. It was very good of you to come. I'm only sorry you didn't bring your boy with you. I wanted to meet the culprit who started this whole business. <laughs> oh, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Cronin, Secretary of Defense, Mr. Sparks. How do you do? Mr. Sparks. Mr. Cronin. And General Burdett. How do you General Burdett. Hello. Uh, won't you sit down, please? I'm not going to drag this out, Cronin. I'm afraid I've got to break your heart. You made a pretty fair start on that, Mr. President, when you pulled Carrie back to Washington, clamped the censorship on us. Have any further messages been decoded, or aren't we allowed to know? There have been no further decodings. And now there will be no further messages to decode. You must shut down your transmitter. Shut it down? You're not serious. I've got to clamp the lid on this business. Stop these communications. Well, I suppose that lies within your power, Mr. President. You can declare a national emergency. I don't have to declare it. It's here, and not merely national. You've shattered the economy of the civilized world. I'm not interested in economics, Mr. Secretary. Who makes or who loses money doesn't seem as important to me as the chance to, to advance civilization a thousand years in one jump. Our job isn't the advancement of civilization. It's to preserve the country handed down to us. If we believed that, every scientist from Franklin to Edison would have been suppressed. Gentlemen, gentlemen. I'm sorry, Mr. President. If you order it, sir, of course I'll have to shut my transmitter down. But I'll never do it of my own volition. Even though it threatens national security? Does it threaten national security to know that man can look forward to a longer lifespan? That he has at his disposal the power to eliminate 90% of the world's work? We've learned that from the four messages we've decoded. There are 13 others that we haven't translated. Plus the one we received today. So long as they're not decoded, they can't threaten anything. I said that we haven't translated. Carrie released the bulletin on uh, cosmic power at 11.22 p.m. Pacific Coast time, the night of the 27th. The same bulletin was released in Moscow at 9.30 a.m. the morning of the 28th. Well, what of it? We, we broadcast everything on the Voice of America anyway. But there's an 11-hour differential between Moscow and San Diego, Cronin. 9.30 a.m. in Moscow is 52 minutes earlier than 11.22 the night before in San Diego. You mean the Russians are intercepting and decoding? Well, is any other explanation possible? Calder. Who? The man who invented the hydrogen valve. It's the very heart of the transmission. Now you see how important it is to stop your communication with this other planet. I see now why they can't be stopped. What do you mean? If Calder can pick up our messages, he can also pick up messages of his own. We may stop, but he won't. And then our national security really is threatened. Yes. For the secretary, Mr. President, eyes only. It's a note from Admiral Carey. They've decoded another message to days. Uh, Carey's outside now, Mr. President. Have him come in, please. Admiral Carey? Come in, Admiral, come in. You'll forgive me, Mr. President, but the Secretary left orders that uh, no matter where you Have you got another time. message? Yes, we've got one. Oh, may I, sir? I think he's entitled to that. This is nonsense. It's, it's impossible. What is it, Cronin? Well, you remember, sir, we asked them how, with their free use of cosmic energy, they were prevented from blowing each other off the face of the map. If they have an answer to that, I'll welcome it. Well, uh, according to this, they submitted the question to their supreme leader. You say spiritual, Bill. I'm not sure it shouldn't be something even stronger. Godlike was Dr. Stokes' translation. What is the message, Chris? You have been given knowledge and have used it for destruction. Seven lifetimes ago, you were told to love goodness and hate evil. Why have you denied the truth? The Sermon on the Mount, on Mars. But don't talk nonsense, Linda. Love goodness and hate evil? What else would you call it? I, I don't understand it. I don't either, Chris. But I'm glad we installed the oscillograph, because once the messages are recorded on film, no one can accuse us of garbling them. 
Well, Mr. President, I said I'd never voluntarily suppress a message. But I was wrong. This one can't go out. Why not? Well, it doesn't make sense. It's not scientific. Well, maybe it's the one scientific truth we've forgotten. You mean you take this message seriously? We took the other seriously, didn't we? If we were right to release one message, we must release this too. Mr. President, you know the panic those other messages have caused. Loose a wave of religious hysteria on top of it and every crackpot and his brother will be lecturing on street corners. Mr. President, you're worried about national security. Is there one word in that message that threatens our security? Or anyone else's? And solution, there was none. Save in the rule of Christ alone. My father was very fond of Emerson. May I see that message, please? You're not going to release it. Your arguments in defense of scientific freedom have convinced me. Well, this time Cronin is right, Mr. President. We can't hitch our wagon to that star. We've switched stars, Mr. Secretary. Now we're following the star of Bethlehem. That message is to be broadcast all over the world, in all languages, exactly as decoded. <laughs> Die Mars-Sendung hat keine weitere Erklärung. Wir wissen nur, dass wir es mit einer Person von höchster Wichtigkeit zu tun haben. But what does it mean? Why ask me? I am an expert on electronics, not religious movements. Are there any other messages? Questions by the thousands. Better no answers. Bother the questions. Let us know when they answer. I know I am not alone in being struck by the phrase with which the message begins. Seven lifetimes ago are the words. But we know that the Martian's life is 300 years. So seven lifetimes is about 2,100 years. Or as near as one could ask to the era in which the carpenter of Nazareth went forth to preach his message. Is it only coincidence that the message he broadcast 2,000 years ago should again be broadcast from the supreme being on Mars? If so, then how explain that this authority should know what we on Earth were told 20 centuries ago? Or is it possible that the man of Nazareth and the man of Mars are the same? Get them curlers out of your hair. What for? We're going to church, that's what for. Do you feel all right? Now look, don't argue with me. Get the curlers out of your hair and let's get dressed and get out of here. I... This ain't no time to take chances. to lose.
a faith that is universal in men of all faiths. For while to us the words from Mars seem the very essence of the Christian doctrine, let us not forget that they are also the essence of all other religions, Christian, Mohammedan, Jewish, Buddhist. All are heeding the call to prayer, kneeling humbly in the search for divine guidance. I pray particularly that behind the Iron Curtain, where our eyes are not permitted to see, men will open their hearts to the message of peace and the promise that their rulers have so long denied them. Today's message reads, Ye have denied God's word and worshipped false gods. Thy torment is the price of thine own sin. Сегодняшнее краткое сообщение с Марса гласит: Слушайте, ты отрекся от слова Божьего, ты поклонился идолу, и муки твои суть награда за твои прегрешения, и муки твои суть награда за твои прегрешения. These messages are spreading all over the country, Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, and no one knows how. Villages that have never even seen the radio suddenly erupt. Have you heard the latest message? Is there another? The Americans released it an hour ago. He who follows the tyrant's banner shall wear the tyrant's chains. He who carries God's banner shall know everlasting life. But Tom, do you expect me to tell them that? What you tell them is no concern of mine. Everlasting life! answer. Comrade General, I would not suggest... Suggest what? These uprisings. Is it possible that... The... It is possible that another mass transplantation of population may be necessary. We have forced at the famine 30 years ago. We shall foster another. Let 20 or 30 millions of this sheep die and see how long the religious faith lives. But if the messages continue. We have found a religious revival necessary to get them to fight the Germans. 
We will have another and they will fight the West. Are you sure the valve's working? Oh, I've checked it a dozen times. There must be some reason for their silence up there. Well, they can be a thousand. We've got two atmospheres to get through. Ours may be clear and theirs may be impenetrable, or maybe their transmitter's out of whack. Maybe the operator's got the measles, or maybe he's finished his allotted 300 years, or, or maybe... maybe... they've said everything they have to say. Maybe the rest is up to us. Calling 2B7XK. He won't answer. Come on. There is no need for me in there. You can have the honor of telling the Premier that your communication have bogged down. I don't want to answer his questions. Nasce eto ba caldera? Niet contacta scaldro. Eto chtoje Gaspadin Arginia. Pravda? Prostitje tovarec premier. Janje vinovat. Talk English, you fool! Anything is preferable to that atrocious accent. I'm sorry, comrade premier. Perhaps if I tried again. Has the patriarch arrived yet? Nie kak niet. Go to the airport! Well? There is no answer. Je ponema. Что случилось? Комрад премьер, if I may suggest, the transmitter, we could contact the airport with it. Hurry! Продолжайте. За свидание. Никто не отвечает. Ну что же? We are trying. The lights are still on out there. Товарищ премьер. Singing. It. It was one of the favorite anthems of the cathedrals. That will silence their hymns. What do these superstitious peasants think? They can accomplish against our guns. She and Stuart went to town. I haven't got back yet. The baby had the sniffles and I... What? Are you serious? Well, yes, yes, right away. What the heck? First program ever to be televised to the Western world from Russia. Ladies and gentlemen, the British ambassador to Moscow. And I have been appointed to speak for my fellow members of the diplomatic corps. In days to come, thousands of volumes will be written about the miracle of these last 12 days. The miracle of a nation finding its soul. As the messages from Mars spread throughout the country, the heart of the Russian people began to swell with an old faith, and spontaneous demonstrations of that faith took place. From the churches, they moved on the jails, the fortresses. And here in Moscow, the arrival yesterday of the patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church provided the tinder that burned down the Soviet edifice. Thousands of the residents of this city are now dead. They died in the creation of a new government. The patriarch has its provisional head. As the new leader of a new Russia, he will speak to you himself. This morning, our armies 
in occupation of other lands have been recalled to our own soil. We have thrown off our chain of 40 years of bondage. We now free our neighbors of death. This is the first act of our new government. The second is the reopening of our churches so that our people may worship God in freedom and in accord with their own conscience. The bells of those churches now speak for us. They speak only what is in our hearts. The prayer that all men can henceforth live in peace. I wish you were a little older, son. I wish you could remember this. <laughs> now I have to go get. people, son, your mother and I. Names in the papers, decorations, scientific awards. <laughs> you know what's really important? You. You are our immortality. You and your brother, the kids you'll have and the lives you'll lead. <laughs> You're the blessed generation. Chris, have you heard the news? Mitchell called me. I couldn't believe it. I heard it on the car radio. Chris, you should see that crowd. You should see their faces. Hmm. And I didn't want the religious messages released. <laughs> Dad, the Russians on the radio. Suffering cow. <laughs> <laughs> Dad, Maybe you've reformed the Russians, Pop, but not young yeah. hopeful. <laughs> Communications, I mean. Suppose, suppose we never make it again. There's nothing wrong with the transmitter. Atmospheric conditions won't explain it either. No matter how bad they are, we, we'd pick up something. Would it really matter? We talk of their older civilization, and what have they given us? Nothing we couldn't have had all along. Prayers were given us long before wireless. Good evening, Mr. Cronin. Who are you? How'd you get in here? My credentials. The hydrogen valve. Uh -huh. The original specifications. Where did you get these? I drew them. Calder. Franz Calder. Where have you come from? This afternoon, you parked your station wagon in front of the post office. You didn't look in the back when you drove home. Neither did the guards that surround your place. <laughs> this, this is the most stupendous joke I've ever heard. We thought you were in Russia, and here you were in this country all the time. Only since yesterday, Mr. Cronin. <laughs> it wasn't exactly a triumphant entry. Mr. Cronin, did you ever have to crawl through the mud beneath a barbed wire fence? Hide like a hunted animal to avoid the border inspectors? In heaven's name, why? Why? I developed a dislike of jails. Jail? Are you out of your mind, man? Have you heard nothing of what's happened in the world? In spite of your record, there'd have been an open door for the inventor of the hydrogen valve. Which you stole. Well, don't talk nonsense. Your specifications became government property. Anyone had a right to use them. That's a matter of opinion. Don't worry, Mr. Calder. Chris has given you credit for everything that belongs to you. Every scientific journal has given you full credit. If you'll forgive me where I've been, the latest scientific journals were not at hand. I lived in a hut at 11,000 feet in the Andes. An avalanche finished it. 
But I dug myself out. Nine days ago. Well, I'm glad you got out anyway. Uh, we're just about to broadcast. You might be interested in... You're some... right. It will amuse me. All set, Lynn? Yes. It's a shame you didn't get a chance to carry on your work yourself. In a small way, I did. You built a transmitter? Naturally. And then you might have picked up Mars. I tried. I never succeeded. All right, Lynn, shut it off. But with your knowledge and the valve, you should have succeeded. Unless, of course, atmospherics play tricks at that altitude. On some people, Mr. Cronin. You won't mind if I take my coat off, huh? Yes, sir. Uh, on some people. What do you mean by that? Of course, I only got out with what I had in my pockets, but I think uh, this will interest you. There are messages and the replies, all of them. The ones that weren't decoded, too. Then you did pick up Mars? No. How else could you get these? When did you hear from Mars last? Nine days ago, wasn't it? A little after eight o'clock. Now, you figure the difference in time. And you'll find it was about half an hour before my set was smashed. I don't believe it. How slow you were in thinking up that pie formula. <laughs> and the creation of a vocabulary. Huh. Aren't you grateful that I made it so easy for you? <laughs> <laughs> ah. Here you were, the whole mobilized science of the world behind you. And there was I, alone, giving you answers. You sent the messages. The whole thing was a fraud. That credit I will share with you. Why? What were you after? Shall we say, uh, amusement? You thought you'd created a new Earth. And I destroy it. A new heaven. And that I shall destroy. Once my story is told. You can't do it! You can see the possibilities for entertainment, huh? Listen to me, Mr. Calder. I've two children over there in that house. And I'm just one of millions. Millions of women that for the first time know their children are secure. You can't destroy that! Paradise lost, Mrs. Cronin. Paradise lost. That's my present to the world. He's lying, Linda. Those messages were from Mars. They came from outside the atmosphere. You take me for an amateur, eh? Huh? I shot my signals up to hit the heavy side layer. They deflected down at any angle. Naturally, they seem to come from outside the atmosphere. No. Once I detected your signals, the rest was easy. I could accomplish much more making you believe I was Mars than ever getting Mars myself. Chris. What is it? He did not send the religious messages. Of course I didn't. You know that. What do you mean? Here are his messages, the very first few as we received them. But when we asked how they've kept themselves from blowing each other to bits, his answer was, one tribe must hold the power. It had nothing to do with the Sermon on the Mount. It was the prophet talking to us. The prophet. Clever of you to create him. You played right into my hands. I smashed your economic system with a power panic. But that still left my friends in Moscow. I had to smash them too. From my hut, I could see the statue of Christ. I never thought of using him against them. Thank you for that idea. They must have been desperate. Who? Kerry, Sparks, all of them. They must have done this in Washington. Darling, you were there. You spoke with Sparks and the president. Did you think they were play acting? I don't know. I don't know. Ah, who did it was immaterial. When I saw the effect on Moscow, I knew you'd created my weapon for me. That's why I let you raise the world up with all that muck right up to the sky. 
so I can dash it down to hell when I tell my story. You can't do it, Calder. Who's to stop me? God. He had his chance nine days ago. If I hadn't dug myself out, you'd have gotten away with your fraud. It was no fraud. You'd have won. <laughs> it was no fraud. You don't expect me to believe those messages were not faked. We expect you to believe the truth, just the way the rest of the world believes, just the way we believe. But here is my proof. There have been no messages since my transmitter was shattered. How will you explain that to the world, Mr. Cronin? <laughs> Sermon on the Mount. Peace on Earth. No, Mrs. Cronin. You are not dealing with a superstitious peasant. If those first messages were fake, the last were too. The world will believe me, just as your husband believed me. And then you'll all be at each other's throats again. All of you. And I'll have done it. Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. My favorite poem, Mrs. Cronin. The unconquerable will and study of revenge, immortal hate and courage never to submit or yield. That's my God, Mrs. Cronin. Satan. Lucifer's my hero. God beat him. But I'll have beaten God. Nothing will convince you. Nothing. It's 8.26 according to your clock. I sent a telegram in your name inviting the press to be here at 8.30. I need to wait a few minutes before they hear my story. Why didn't you tell it right away? Why did you come here to torture us? Suppose someone had stolen the fruits of your genius. Wouldn't you want to see them humbled in the dust? Perhaps. And it doesn't matter. Linda, you go back to the house. Do you remember what you said to me the night of the first message? Nothing I was connected with could produce evil. It won't, Chris. We'll finish it together. I want you with the boys. It'll only take a minute. Is that what you really want? I love you, darling. You do think me a fool! You think I let you walk out of here to call those private guards of yours? What's the matter, man? Cheer up. The reporters will be here in a few minutes. You like publicity, don't you? Two minutes before they get here. Give me a cigarette, Chris. I can't go through with it, Lynn. Not now. The boys are safe. This is their chance. Give me the cigarette. Funny. In all the years, I've never seen you smoke. You're not going to smoke in here. God gave us free will, Mr. Calder. 
It's what distinguishes us from the animals. We can choose between good and evil. But if we choose evil now, that's the end of the human story. I can't let you do it. Stay where you are. It's a simple problem, isn't it, Mr. Calder? To let you tell your story and risk setting mankind at each other's throats again. Or to see that you keep silent and save mankind. A valve. Give me a light. Don't! Don't! The room's alive with hydrogen. A spark now would... Stop! Stop! You wouldn't kill your wife? Chris, look! Now will you believe? Your set's destroyed. But there's a message coming in. There's your proof! shall what caused the destruction of that laboratory in California. We only know that Chris and Linda Cronin are gone and that in our time there will be no more messages from Mars. For God in his infinite wisdom has decreed that the revelations which came through them, his servants, were sufficient to fulfill his purpose. At the very moment when they were snatched up in that chariot of fire, into the bosom of truth everlasting. A final message was being received. Only the first few words of that message were recorded before the explosion cut it short. Those words were, ye have done well, my good. The rest is silence. Silence. No. No, for as I speak, the bells of a million churches in every far corner of the earth Ring out in salutation to the Earth's new day of hope. The voices of the joyful rise in a thousand hymns. Hymns not of grief, but of thanksgiving. And mankind, kneeling in gratitude for its redemption, prays for the spirit of this man and this woman. Of them, as of no mortals before them, it may be said, the whole earth is their sepulcher. And so the message does not remain unfinished. The miracle we have beheld has cleansed our souls and wiped the scales from our eyes. With the new vision given us, we who are left can complete that message. Ye have done well, good and faithful servants. Enter ye into the joy of your Lord. Thy monument is a world of peace. You lucky boys. You're their sons. Now, folks, it's time to say good night. We sincerely appreciate your patronage and hope we've succeeded in bringing you an enjoyable evening of entertainment. Please drive home carefully and come back again soon. Good night.